games, three games into this season. You know the hottest player in this whole league is? Carl Anthony Towns. Towns wastes no time. The cat says, I'll see you. He's got 73 points and 29 boards in the first two games of the season. The Rose is oh. rejected by Towns. Oh, he's had 35 and 10. He joins the company of Wilt Chamberlain, Carl Malone, Elgin Baylor, Moses Malone. Towns with a head of steam. <laughs> Towns open for three and one. Towns with a head of steam. Eight here for Towns. Cat gets in and one for Towns. And is he okay? Fall last night that kind of, he was just so exhausted that he needs to take a little break. I'm Scott Van Pelt here at ESPN. This, this astounding and unprecedented story continues to evolve that the NBA is suspending the season. There's something to update you on my life. This disease needs to not be taken lightly. Please protect your families, your loved ones, your friends, yourself. Jacqueline Cruz Towns, the mother of Minnesota Timberwolves all-star Carl Anthony Towns, died today from complications of COVID-19. She was 58 years old. Jackie was diagnosed with the virus just a month ago and had been placed into a medically induced coma. Three weeks ago in an emotional video on Instagram, Carl Anthony Towns talked about his mother's fight and urged people to take the threat of this virus seriously. This has been a very arduous year for you. Earlier this um, year, your mother passed, transitioned um, Jacqueline Cruz Towns due to complications from COVID-19. Can you take me back to those five weeks? I know that in those five weeks prior to her transition, there was a lot of conference calls. There was a lot of, you know, you took a lot of trips to Minnesota. She's going to make it. She's not going to make it. Is this my time to say goodbye? Is this not my time to say goodbye? Yeah. Um, just what that was doing mentally to yourself and just moments before her yeah. her transition. It started off more of just, just trying to get her to, you know, it, COVID was so early on in everyone's mind. It kind of was played down by everybody. So it was something that was never taken serious, but, you know, me and my sister just realized our mom, you know, who's had complications with health and everything, so in my life and growing up, so we knew what it was, and we knew that with her you have to take the extra precaution, but she wasn't, she was like everyone else, they just didn't know, and we, me and my sister, were very verbal about that she should be Getting checked just in case she has COVID because she wasn't feeling well. When did you guys realize that during that process? When it, she just progressively was getting worse. She was just getting worse, and I said, you know, you gotta, you gotta go to the hospital. And it's amazing. The story is really sad, but we took her to. Um, funny enough, the hospital I was born at, at JFK Hospital in Edison, New Jersey. It just got to a point that, you know, they were like, you know, you got to start thinking about some things. And I was just like, no, she's not done. She's a fighter. She knows she's going to fight to the end. So I, I flew out from Minnesota to New Jersey and I went to see her and I've seen her in different states in my life. But this one was different because there was just so many things happening, there so many tubes in her. So now I'm like looking and it's like kind of not looking like her. And I can feel her energy. There's something that a mother and a mother and a child connection that you just can never be misplaced. We speak telepathically. She was speaking to me without saying a word. And I felt like she was like, I'm good. I got a lot of energy left. We're good. Like we're Because good. she was in a coma. Yeah. So she wasn't verbally saying anything, but for you, because of the connection that you guys have, you felt her talking spirit to energy talking yes. to you. And so that yes. probably instilled some hope. She was face down. Um, they were trying to improve the circulation in her lungs. So she was face down and uh, just giving her back rubs and just trying to mess with her senses a little bit. And 
I'm looking at the monitor and I could tell she notices that someone's touching her differently. I could tell she was like there, she was cooperative in a way, but they didn't feel it, but I felt it and I knew what it was. So, and she was transferred to University of Penn. She started getting the medication she needed and everything. And they took amazing care of for her because they pulled some stops out to improve her chance of just living during the transport. And my dad having COVID, couldn't talk to him, couldn't see him. So they had COVID at the same time yeah. together. And my dad slowly recovered. And I think some of the complications with COVID were resulted with my mom's previous health history. She made him miraculously over there to Penn, stabilized her, got her settled in. And then at that point, the University of Penn was coming through. She slowly, slowly started getting better. So week two, she started progressing. At three. At three. At three. Slowly but surely, she started getting better. We had game nights on Saturdays as a family, and she would just be there, and we'd have the camera facing her, and we would see her, and we would do, we had beer pong. My sister was playing beer pong with the kids, I remember. <laughs> and my dad was just looking at her. Communication to her, at least, was something that was important to all of us. It made it feel somewhat normal. I was just talking to every doctor I could get a resource on. We had started a conversation of waking her up. That was news to me because you know, she's just been in a coma for so long. There's so many more things that could happen the longer she's in a coma. Mm -hmm. How many weeks was she in the coma? I don't, I don't actually remember exactly. We started a conversation and I remember Saturday, we had said, we're gonna start on Monday. Leaning off of all the sedatives and then she's gonna slowly wake up and we're gonna start taking the tubes out the weekend, the next weekend, the week after. I had some amazing doctors as well on the side for me. The whole situation was too emotional for my dad. And as strong as he is, it was it's something that was different. I never want to feel comfortable at that time. I never wanted to feel comfortable because I felt comfort would lead to something bad. So, But it brought hope. It brought a lot of optimism. I remember talking to Chuck and I just said, you know, like, things are looking positive. I had this old bottle, I had this uh, really rare bottle of Hennessy. I took a, sh a shot, I was very excited. I never opened that bottle for special things. So, And then I remember my phone was went, went off and I was like, and it was my dad, but my dad called me solely. So we, this whole time, have always been on group FaceTimes. But when he called me and I realized right away, I analyzed it, I knew something was off and I could feel something was off. And, you know, my heart was just, jumping i answered the phone and i and I answered and he just looked stressed and i said what's wrong i said what's wrong and he was just like she's gone she had a stroke during the night and she 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 she's gone i said what the f like is it not uh, is she taking a step back like what's the what's the next step because in my mind i'm just thinking about steps she just told me that those doctors had thought there was no way, there's no way for meaningful life from her after the stroke. You know, on, on Easter Sunday, they mostly told me she died. I wouldn't allow, I wasn't going to have my mom go through all that and not give her a, 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 a last chance. God works in miraculous ways. Now it, it got to a point where it was just harming her. I gave her all the time, and I made <laughs> I made the hardest decision you can make. I called my sister, told her what the decision I made was. You know, you gotta live with that. So I made that decision, told my dad, and then from there I proceeded to make the the most difficult calls in my life, um, and will be in my life. I. I had to call her sisters, I had to call um, my dad's family. I think the worst call, the most, the most difficult one was um, it was calling her mom. It was calling my grandmother, so telling her you mostly, you lost your daughter. Mm -hmm. I've done everything as a, as a grandson could do to protect her. I gotta let her go. And it was, um, it was difficult. 
it was very difficult because she's just screaming on the phone. Her sisters actually went to her grandma's house, so they held her down. She was just going hysterical, but that was the most difficult call for me because there's nothing worse, you know, than losing your kid. And I had told that to many people after I said, you know, I will never have a pain like that again. But I will say there's no pain that measures up to losing your mom. But if I lost my kid, I'd be devastated. So that was a tough one. And that's why that was the toughest one of them all. And that one hurt. So, I mean, they all hurt, but that one really, really bothered me. And um, I had the iPad still on. So I gave her family and I gave them all the chance to say their goodbyes to her personally. I hadn't pulled the plug yet. I wanted her to live and give people the respect that they deserve in her life to say goodbye personally. Allowed her mom this year, have her moment. And uh, at that moment I pulled the plug and I just let her pass. You know, they told me she may be alive for another hour me too, but you know she's in, she's been fighting for a long time. So they pulled the plug. In twenty five, she was gone. Mm -hmm. they, we were talking to her. We were laughing. It's it's such a weird thing. My sister was bringing up stories. She's laughing. Her sister's on the phone, and I remember they just she cut us off. She said, "Hey, I just want to let you guys know that she has passed away officially. She had took her last breath with laughter." And there was no other way. Jackie would have wanted it. She didn't want people to cry for her. She wanted people to laugh. So she was sent off with laughter. That just hurts. It hurts so bad every day. And, you know, I'm just glad I had the time I did. Michelle is very fortunate. I'm always gonna be jealous of her in a way. She was given 41 years with her. In 41 years, she's had two amazing kids. I'm 24. I just started figuring my life out. You know, I'm going to be jealous. I'm always going to be jealous. But, um, I'm just happy I had the time I did. Because it, it, it made me who I am. I can live with that. I'm always going to be jealous for the little things, but no, they're big. But I'm glad that even in a way I wish that never happened. My kids get to meet her through me. Because I am the most like her in any way. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was a tough time. It's still tough. Um, I really just tried not to uh, bring it up and talk about it, but of course you get it out of me, so. <laughs> so... And it hurt because I had told her, you know, she's gonna get be she's gonna get better and better, but she's gonna have to go through a worse period to get to a better period. Mm -hmm. And she was confused, and I said, "Just trust me, mom. I got you. You know, I wouldn't do anything to you." And she said, "Okay, I trust you." And you know, and I remember she was walking, and she just told me, "She said, I'm so sorry if I ever did anything that didn't make you proud of me as a mom." Or anything. And I said, no, stop talking like that. Don't talk like that to me. I said, you're going to be just fine. You're going to go in. You're going to be in a coma just for a little. And they're going to bring you back out. And you'll be good as new. And we'll talk and laugh about the situation and go even closer. What has your grieving process been like? How have you mitigated the pain? Does the pain come and go? Are you numb? Have you cling to friends, family? Have you pushed away friends or family, ran from God or closer to God. What has the process been like for you these last couple of months? I think we just passed the five month mark. I've leaned on friends. I've leaned on just my, just my family. I could never replace her. She was everything to all of us, but the least thing I could do is pick up some of her pieces, try to rebuild the puzzle and then fill in those other holes on just my own puzzle pieces. I think I've been both numb, but also the feelings go in and out. It was such a tough time for her to pass, you know. 
with her birthday coming right up, my parents' anniversary on her birthday. Dad's a very smart man to do that. Mm -hmm. Mother's Day came first. Mm -hmm. um, my dad's B-Day just passed. Uh, there's just a lot of things, you know, that passed that brought back a lot of memories that some of the holidays I didn't have a moment and some days I did. And it doesn't matter the holiday, it doesn't matter the day. It just matters how I feel at that moment. It could be a random thought, you know, looking at the niece and nephew. You know, it, it could be anything. I can't really describe it because it's something that's not describable. You know, there's a lot of adjectives you could use for emotions, but for me, I just, I just always, when people ask me, how are you doing? I always just tell them it's a, it's a day by day thing. You know, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know what the next day holds for me. I just know that right now I gotta keep it together and try to find the, the smile and fun in life. You know? But do you have to keep it together? Do you have to no, find the smile? No, I don't, I don't, but when you deal with kids and you deal with two people who understand the pain you're going through, you want to be the one that brightens the room, just like her. So finding ways that, I think for me, I think if I was to say, how am I coping and how am I healing from this? I'm trying to heal myself through others. You know? What does that look like? I'm trying to do as much as I can for my sister and my father trying to take care of my friends and I'm trying to heal myself through them. It's helped, but I think that one day, and I know it's creeping up, I feel it every day, it's gonna creep up that I'm gonna have to find a way to deal with it actually. And that's why I wanted to do this. I thought this would be therapeutic for me to admit that these things are real and how I feel is real and you know, be able to try to find some normalcy again. Life, life is a life is a game, and mm -hmm. I'm just playing one, one chess piece at a time. Yeah, one day at a time, yeah. one day at a time. Well, I applaud you for your transparency, for your vulnerability, for even seeing the need and the purpose of why you should do this. Not only for yourself, but for others and for people out there that may be going through a tumultuous time, a grieving time that they can, you know, relate to you and your story. So thank you for being vulnerable and for being doing it for the betterment of others. So I appreciate it.